uh, won't take on the really serious issues. They don't really speak about female genital mutilation or throwing acid on women's faces or child brides or honor killings. That would be scary, you see, because they, there could be repercussions from the people that you're criticizing. But to go after the poor, inane, somewhat castrated, sorry to say it this way, uh, shirt gate guy, uh, because he wore a shirt that seemed to have some offensive images on them, even though those images were drawn by a woman. Uh, well, that's that actually can still show that I am engaged socially, that I could be outraged by the patriarchy, and there won't be any backlash against me. So I could show that I am serious and engaged and not lose the not risk the fact of uh, of losing my head. Perfect. Let's do some virtue signaling. And I, I had an experience with this, you know, in my personal life. My girlfriend's dad is basically, you know, a Guardian reader, a progressive, a left winger, yes. a liberal. With this whole migrant crisis, this has given people the opportunity to virtue signal to an unbelievable level. Basically, right. they've got a five bedroom house. And, you know, given London housing standards, it's not a big house. It's the bedrooms are tiny. He actually wanted to take in two immigrant families to live in these two office bedrooms, which were basically, you know, tiny. They couldn't have housed a family. They could barely house one person in there. So again, merely making this, this observation, this advocacy for virtue signaling with no intention whatsoever of following through on it, simply to earn these social brownie points. That's what it's all about. But I want to There's say- There's a great- Go ahead. Sorry, before, before you go on. There's a paper by a colleague, some marketing colleagues, uh, I don't remember the exact title of the paper, but they, they say, I mean, speaking of virtue signaling, they say going green to be seen, right? So instead of using, let's say, a Ferrari to impress, you get that Prius. Boy, it shows that you are green and you are serious and you can hug trees and so on. Yeah. And again, you find often in, in these people's oh, personal lives, they, they're not following through on any of this. They're not really green people. They don't really give right. a damn. They just want the perception that they are to get the social brownie points. But again, staying on, staying on social media, I just want to move on to this. You know, these studies have shown that social media is making people more depressed, despite the virtue signaling, despite the social brownie points. We've got an article here from The Atlantic, and we touched upon this with Anthony Gucciardi earlier. The flight from conversation. The psychologist Sherry Turkle argues that replacing face-to-face -face communication with smartphones is diminishing people's capacity for empathy. We also have the studies showing that, you know, Facebook makes people depressed because it creates this false impression that everybody else's life is so dynamic and so interesting, theirs isn't. Then we've got the, the interaction with this article, which of course is a, you know, in the real world, social interaction is a crucial element of maintaining emotional stability and happiness. But in terms of the cyber world, it seems to have the opposite effect. It only seems to make people more alienated when they're using these supposed social networks. It only seems to be making them more disconnected from other people and more unhappy. So why is this happening? And, you know, what impact is this growing obsession with narcissism, which I think you've also talked about, having, you know, on just the way that humans behave, how they interact with each other and uh, how their brains are wired? Well, there's, there's a great uh, study that I think was conducted, or a longitudinal study over 70 years, I might get some of the details wrong, where they sort of looked at longitudinally what ultimately makes people happy. And I think the, the leader of that project sort of summarized it by simply saying something to the effect of, you know, just have meaningful relationships with people that love, love you and, love, and you love them back or something to that effect. Uh, we are a social species, right? Uh, one of the reasons why... Uh, uh, placing somebody in solitary confinement could be considered cruel and unusual punishment, even though putting them out in general public might expose them to being knived and shanked and killed and raped. Uh, well, people are willing to take that risk because ultimately to put me alone is maybe a greater punishment than me fa having to face uh, an onslaught of aggressive folks. At least I am amongst others. And so I think what, what social media does, to some extent it is good, it allows me to uh, reconnect with people that I might not have seen since my childhood in Lebanon. Uh, but on the other hand, once taken to an extreme, it is very isolating. And I mean, frankly, uh, I've succumbed to it at times, right? Where my wife will come to me and say, and she'll say something like, could you please get off 
you know, your social media and just pay a bit of attention to us. It's a very intoxicating uh, set of portals uh, because it makes us feel as though we're connected with the world. But paradoxically, it also disconnects us from those that maybe are closest to us. We're talking to Professor Gad Sad. His YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash Gad Sad. Racing through the topics here, I want to mention universities and free speech because obviously you're a professor, you move amongst these people, some of them are your friends. You know, trigger warnings, safe spaces, this complete intolerance for intellectual diversity on college campuses. Banning feminists and anti-feminists recently at Manchester University, yes. they had a, an event called does feminism have a problem with free speech? And they right. banned a feminist and an anti-feminist, Julie Bindle and Milo Yiannopoulos, because they might trigger, God forbid, they might challenge the ideas of the people who attend that university. So when did universities go from, you know, being arenas of vigorous, unrestrained debate to progenitors of thought control and censorship? And who's to blame? Uh, well, I think it's a confluence of factors. Uh, you know, postmodernism came in and about 40 years ago and said, hey, look, there are no privileged ways of knowing. Uh, there are no absolute truths. There are no human universals. All viewpoints are reasonable and could be held, right? And so who are you to say that uh, gravity is what makes something fall? Maybe it's, I love that term. I heard it on Drunken Peasants podcast. Maybe it's intelligent falling instead. Uh, so, so, there, so this idea that all possible uh, frameworks are acceptable creates this sort of fake tolerance, right? Where, uh, you know, who are we to judge about what is true or not? And so when somebody comes with a very dogmatic position, then they recoil at that, especially when that dogmatic position goes against the politically correct position. And so I think because of a very variety of confluence of factors, uh, both academics and students are not armed to engage in reasoned debate. We'll be back with Gad Sad after the break. Of course, no less than Edward Snowden came out against this yesterday in a tweet. He said, quote, an individual trying to limit speech at universities is interested in neither university nor justice. That's what Edward Snowden said about this yesterday. We'll be back. Final segment with Gad Sad after the break. Alex Jones Show Live, Infowars.com. Stay tuned. It's the Alex Jones Show Live with me, your host, Paul Joseph Watson. Going to go to your calls after our guest here in about 10 minutes' time. It's 1 800 259 9231. We're going to open the phones up to talk about whatever issue you, you want, you like. And of course, infowarsstore.com. This is what drives the entire broadcast. Liver cleanse, we've got 20% off on B12. We've got brain force. We've got knockout. That's the sleep aid, which of course has got great reviews as well. Infowarsstore.com to get all the supplements. Of course, we also sell T-shirts, DVDs, all manner of other products that you can use for yourself to wake people up, to start conversations. And it all goes to helping this broadcast to building the platform that we've basically slaved over for the past 20 years to get to this level where we're having a direct impact on the narrative, challenging the mainstream media on all these issues. Coming up tonight, David Knight's going to be the host for InfoWars Nightly News and they're going to be covering the debate, the democratic debate live. Of course, this is the first debate. Only six are scheduled. So this is going to be a short process. Of course, Hillary Clinton is completely afraid of saying anything whatsoever in public. That's going to be interesting. CNN, Anderson Cooper said he's not going to try to mix up the candidates. David Knight will be. We'll be grilling them. We'll be analyzing them on their actual platform, what they actually stand for rather than the sound bites, rather than the surface fluff. And that's all going to be live tonight. InfoWars Nightly News hosted by David Knight. So be sure to tune in for that. We're talking to behavioral scientist Gad Sad, youtube.com forward slash Gad Sad. I wanted to touch on radical Islam because this is a subject that you've delved into, of course. Whenever I go really hard against Islam on social media, on InfoWars.com, and merely question whether it deserves the title of the religion of peace, I immediately get death threats. Again, proving my point. And, you know, I posted an image of ISIS toilet roll on Facebook, got death threats consistently for about two weeks, 
which again is why I question whether it's a religion of peace. But you've been critical of some of the tenets of Islam. You've looked at the Quran and you've criticized liberals for basically not daring to oppose what is fundamentally an illiberal belief system. So how are liberals able to excuse and justify their immediate abandonment of liberal principles when it comes to criticism of Islam? I think that's the big blind spot of so-called liberals. Or again, I prefer to call them the regressive leftists, a term that is really taking off in the public discourse. Uh, I think it's because they make the mistake of assuming that Islam is a, pe is a religion uh, of the marginalized, of people of color. And therefore, when I look into my playbook of uh, liberalism and progressive progressivism, uh, I know that I should not be criticizing people of color because we all know that it's the patriarchy that's bad, it's the white man that's bad. And, and therefore, I'm faced here with a dilemma. Is it okay for me to criticize the behavior of others if they score high on uh, the victimology poker hand or not? Now, there is a new brand of liberals, and I like to think that I'm included in that group, that says, look, if you truly believe in fundamental liberal values, then you have to expect that all ideologies are fair game when it comes to uh, criticism. Regrettably, the regressive left, leftists are not willing to do that. Again, because they view it as racist, phobic, bigoted to criticize an ideology. When, when we repeatedly state that you are not attacking individuals, most Muslims are undoubtedly perfectly lovely people and yet the ideology to which they subscribe might contain tenets that are open for criticism. Surely that should be a liberal value that we all hold dear. They don't. And even the Pope came out, you know, after Charlie Hebdo and said, you shouldn't make fun of people's religions. You shouldn't insult people's religions. That's not part of free speech. Again, that was breathtaking. I just couldn't believe when he said that. Absolutely astonishing. What I wanted to ask though is, you know, we've had polls in France a few months ago. They found that 25% of young people in France, this is 18 to 25 year olds, 25% in France support ISIS. That doesn't mean right. they're violent militants. It doesn't mean they're going to go and be terrorists, but ideologically they support ISIS. We found similar numbers in other European countries. How, I'll ask this question after the break. We're going to talk about that. We're going to give Gad Saad the final word on evolutionary consumption as well. And we're going to plug his YouTube channel, tell you how you can get his books. This is The Alex Jones Show Live again. David Knight coming up tonight with live Democratic debate coverage on the InfoWars Nightly News. Your call's coming up, 1-800-259-9231. This is The Alex Jones Show Live, InfoWars.com. Stay tuned. It's The Alex Jones Show Live. I'm your host, Paul Joseph Watson. We're just finishing up here in the final five minutes with Gad Sand. We'll be going to your calls after that. Before the break, I just mentioned radical Islam again. It's a topic that I've covered. It's a topic that Gad Sand has covered on his YouTube channel. Again, polls in France, 25% of young people show ideological support for ISIS. Similar polls in other European countries. Just quickly on this, Gad said, how wide of the mark is this idea that advocates of radical Islam are only a tiny, tiny minority? Well, I guess it depends how we define extremists, right? And I think uh, Sam Harris tried to make that point. So if you say an extremist is somebody who holds very violent views and is willing to act on them, well, then it might be a, just a very small few percentages. If it's people who, who support those guys, but then are not willing to themselves engage in the actual violence, then it becomes much larger. So if you like, the concentric circle gets larger depending on how we define extremism. But even if the number were very small, right? I mean, let's, let's, let's be charitable and say 5% of all uh, people who are adherents of Islam uh, are the most problematic. Well, 5% of 1.6 billion people is still a very sizable number. And so to argue that it is irrational, it is Islamophobic, right? It is a term that actually makes it insane for you to be afraid of that threat, right? You are insane. You suffer from an irrational phobia if you're fearful of that 5%. Uh, that's how, again, you shut down debate, right? Because people are going to think twice before they try to criticize an ideology that's going to certainly come after you, if not physically, to harm your reputation. So there is something to worry about. 
And the more people get up to talk about it, uh, the better it will be uh, for our future. And again, just because you criticize radical 